Okay, we're recording, and uh, I'm really chuffed to have Dr. Rachel Brown today on the podcast, who's a consultant psychiatrist in the UK NHS, the National Health Service, and who's interested in low-carb, high-fat, or metabolic psychiatry. So welcome on today, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks so much for coming on. Um, we first started talking uh, a year or two or so back, um, when you, you bought some of my ice cream, I think. That's and, great. <laughs> um, and it was great to find someone who had experienced, you know, uh, big strides in, in health from changing how they ate. I, I never tire of hearing those stories, but also that you were a psychiatrist in the NHS. So um, we've had Agnes Aiton and uh, Ali Ibrahim on, the consultant psychiatrist special, specialising in eating disorders. I've interviewed Dr. Chris Palmer, who's a psychiatrist um, in the Harvard system in America. That episode isn't out yet, although it might be by the time everyone airs. Um, I'm, I've spoken to Dr. Ian Campbell, who's running the study at Edinburgh University on um, ketogenic diets for bipolar. I've had Amber O'Hearn on the podcast a few times, who's bipolar has not come back since she changed to being carnivore um, about a decade ago. Um, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got into it and, and where you are with it now, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so kind of more in terms of the dietary stuff. In the dietary yeah. stuff and then how it relates to psychiatry. Okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've had an interest in nutrition and natural health I would say for as long as I can remember and um, so I went to university specifically to go into psychiatry um, but over the years I've had my own kind of experimentations with following different dietary patterns just from my own health point of view um, so I first got into low carb probably back in about 2000 whenever Atkins came out and was really big um, back then kind of did that on and off for a while straight away for a few years um, and probably for the last 11, 12 years or so, I've been low carb, not always keto, so not always very low carb. Um, but I went properly keto probably about five years ago, four or five years ago, I would say. And then that gradually transitioned into carnivore from my point of view. So I've been carnivore for three years now, three years this month. Um, I'm quite happy to talk about kind of the benefits I've seen from, from my own point of view in relation to health. Um, but I suppose it's particularly since I went keto and then subsequently carnivore that I've really become acutely aware of how many people are out there who've actually benefited um, from changing their diets in relation to their mental health. So it's probably the last three years of carnivore that's particularly piqued my interest there. Um, I, I did some training with Georgia Ede um, in terms of her um, clinician training using ketogenic diets um, in a clinical setting. I think that was back in, that was two years ago now that I completed that. So that was really nice to do and to connect with a, a group of clinicians, not all psychiatrists, but from other disciplines as well. Um, people from, there wasn't a single, you know, there was not another person from the UK in that group. So it was really nice to connect with people from all around the world. And, and we keep in contact now on an email group. So that's really nice to hear when new studies come out and um, other people's successes where they're working. Um, so, yeah, in terms of how diet relates to mental health, um, I, mean, I just think it's absolutely huge. So I think it's fairly commonly accepted now that mental health disorders are inflammatory conditions. Um, and actually I've trained in functional medicine as well. So although I practice in Western medicine and allopathic medicine in the NHS, probably one of my bigger interests lies in, in functional medicine. So that's some training I did in the last couple of years. Um, but I, I think um, I think not enough attention is paid to addressing underlying causes of mental disorders, particularly the inflammation. So from my point of view in mainstream psychiatry, we accept that mental disorders are inflammatory and, and you know there's evidence of raised inflammatory markers in depression, for example, or bipolar disorder. But nobody really asked the question as to why is somebody inflamed? What's causing the inflammation? Um, so I've grown increasingly frustrated at, at the approach 
which is kind of how I was trained where you make a diagnosis, you do a few blood tests to exclude common underlying conditions like a thyroid disorder, for example. Um, and then you generally go on to prescribe medications according to whatever the diagnosis might be. Um, and I suppose, you know, I have seen times definitely when some people have benefited from medications, but I've also seen lots of treatment failure in my discipline. Um, and yeah, so it's just been eye-opening to see how many people are actually out there telling their stories in terms of being able to reduce, sometimes even come off medications and get into symptomatic remission with serious mental health disorders. And um, when, when they've been through various treatment cycles in the past that didn't really didn't really have the same benefit in terms of their symptoms. Um, so at the moment I have, I attend a mental health group run by Reviro Health. So that's within the carnivore health sphere. Um, and you hear lots of, lots of different stories there of people who've improved um, and are doing really well after changing their diets. Um, I have one particular contact, um, Brett Lloyd. I don't know if you're aware of him. Um, but he's on Instagram as Thankful Carnivore, and he's somebody who was unable to work for 40 odd years because of recurrent severe depression, psychotic depression, even. I think every single treatment he tried apart from ECT, I mean, he eventually managed to become well and, and absolutely free of mental health symptoms um, by going carnivore. Um, and he's been well now. I think it might be four years now that he's he's been doing that. Um, and his his story, he's given a lot of podcasts in terms of telling his story. So that was really compelling. And I think something that really piqued my interest was hearing Michaela Peterson's story. I'm assuming you will be familiar with that one. Um, just in terms of not just her mental health disorders, her bipolar disorder and depression and anxiety, but also her physical health issues with arthritis and juvenile arthritis and the, the improvements that she's seen there by changing her diet. Um, and so. did you notice a personal improvement? Um, so not in, not particularly in terms of mental health, but then I didn't, I wasn't somebody who'd really suffered from anxiety or depression in the past. Um, however, I do, I don't really know if I had official brain fog as such, but I, I, I have had more clarity um, of thought, I would say. And there's something in the carnivore world called zero carbs then that people refer to, <laughs> which is just generally handling stress a bit better and, and generally being just a bit more level-headed, I would say I've had that benefit. Um, but for me, the benefits of carnivore have been more related to immune health and food addiction. Um, so I'm quite happy to talk about those if that's, if that's um, of any particular interest. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, Agnes Aiton and Ali Ibrahim spoke about how, as far as they're concerned, almost 100% of food addiction and binge eating is driven by processed foods you know there's very very few people who can binge on lamb chops <laughs> you know or, you know or uh, fatty ruminant meat these these uh, foods that we find that are highly nutritious and also satiating through mm -hmm. various mechanisms yeah um and you know clearly that's most carnivores experience and the a lot of people talk about sticking to that way because even on keto when there's mm -hmm. um almond flowers and sweeteners and stuff they find that they can still gain weight binge eat feel bad about themselves mm -hmm. have an unhealthy feeling relationship with food unless mm -hmm. they really um stick to uh animal foods that allow them to feel full and satisfied um and you know whatever that means for them so is that is that something like your experience as well yeah absolutely so um I mean for years I thought I knew that I had a bit of an issue with sugar as in I found it difficult to to moderate or just have in small amounts um I never really had an issue in terms of savory carby foods like bread or pasta or anything like that I could take that or leave that no bother um but there was certainly a lot of preoccupation around food particularly sweet foods and I even remember back in kind of the early 2000s when I did Atkins but um you know I had successful periods and then I had 
um, more difficult times when I definitely remember having very prominent cravings for sweets and ending up having to to go and get a chocolate bar or something to satisfy that and um and actually in retrospect going back to the Atkin era I, I was using a lot of the Atkin bars and the kind of oh I kind of shudder now when I when I look back at the ingredients of some of them um but you know some of the the sweet replacement bars and I don't think that did me any favors at that time because I think that just like they perpetuated cravings for sweet foods. Um, and key, with keto, things got a lot better, but I I probably still had an issue with dark chocolate, I would say, and almond butter it was for me. So those were the the two the two foods that um I sometimes felt a little bit out of control with. Um and and it, it's just it's interesting. So for years I thought I had a bit of an emotional eating issue. And I read, I don't know how many books I've read on that on that matter, but I actually just threw them all out recently because I was clearing out and I thought I don't need these anymore. I'm never going to read them again. But, you know, I must have read 10, 15, 20 books on, on that matter. And um, it wasn't until I went carnivore that I had complete clarity about what the issue had actually been all along. Um, the carnivore gave me just complete food freedom. So absolutely no preoccupation with food. Very clear signals in terms of hunger and satiety. Um, I've not, I know everybody's different, so I do know that there are some people with food addiction who might still struggle with emotional eating and that aspect of it. But for me, that just hasn't been an issue at all since I've gone carnivore. So that's been really refreshing. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. Like, there's no way that you can overeat um, animal fat or, or you know, like lamb or fatty beef or, the, or those kind of foods. You get a very, well, for me anyway, you get a very distinct signal that you've had enough and it's time to stop and then you just don't think about food again until until you're properly hungry so yeah that's a bit of a revelation I have to say if my 20 year old self had known about this <laughs> however many years ago yeah life might have been a lot easier in many ways yeah the you know the, the zen comes in many forms doesn't it and that was one of the the blogs that I read early doors sort of six years ago or so about um, zerocarbzen.com. I think Ismail Fleur is the, the person who started that, okay. who um, is involved in Principia Carnivora as well on Facebook. And um, I think it's her that started Zero Carb Zen. Anyhow, that is a real website and it talks about that. And it's certainly something that I've felt both on keto and carnivore. Um, you know, um, Ian Campbell talked about kind of, you know, I never had bipolar um, and I certainly had disordered eating, uh, would tend to binge sometimes and, you know, had anxiety, uh, depressive symptoms. I was diagnosed with ADHD um, and Ian Campbell spoke about Basically, his life was in tatters with from bipolar two, which he calls the shit sequel to bipolar one that should never have been made. Oh, uh, I never realized that 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 he'd had that. Okay, yeah. Mm, mm. yeah. And that he thought, well, I might as well kind of be thin and have a shit life. So <laughs> um he did keto and then he said it was like the national grid went on in his head for the first yeah. time since he was a yeah. kid. And for um, Siobhan Huggins, who does, uh, who does work with uh, Dave Feldman on cholesterol, mm -hmm. um, she, when she, I can't remember if she went keto or carnival, but she said that one day she was just, you know, in a car park somewhere and she just realized that all this sort of nasty noise had stopped. She felt calm and she felt zen. It's not necessarily happy or elated or, or manic. It's yeah. just it's just contented with things. Yeah, I think for me it's been a it's like been a security or just feeling secure. Like and um yeah, I, I don't know. I've been trying to reflect on what the experience has been for me because I've always been quite a shy person. And so sometimes, you know, it can be a real challenge as an introvert to go into a huge room full of people and speak people particularly people you don't know sometimes it's worse when it's people you do know um but I, I definitely think I've got less in the way of of kind of social anxiety that way in those situations even though you know I wouldn't necessarily 
fulfill the criteria for a social anxiety disorder, but there's a whole spectrum of experience. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know how else to explain it really, just feeling a bit more secure in what I believe in and being able to express my views and so on. It's fascinating, it's fascinating. Um, I mean, any, you know, any, anyone on, on this kind of mental health spectrum from someone like yourself who was obviously very high functioning and um, became a, a consultant psychiatrist and um, all the way to people who couldn't get out of bed because of their mental health issues that are effectively better now um, off drugs and, and high functioning themselves. There's mm -hmm. this, um, there's this incredible leveling up, which to describe is often just not believed. You know, David Unwin talks about the importance of putting everything into a peer reviewed paper that's properly reviewed and it's got statistical power um, calling for larger studies, etc. because people just don't believe you. Has that been your experience? I would say so, yeah. So, I mean, uh, most people that I speak to about diet um, either look at me like I'm crazy or or just um, give you some sort of placating type response. Um, I think I, I've got a real issue with evidence-based medicine in general because I think there's so much bias in terms of publication bias and obviously um, pharmaceutical industry funding of studies and um, when when studies with negative results you know aren't published then we don't really get a, a, a true sense of where the evidence lies yeah that, this 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 thing this point that's been made to me recently which is incredible when you think about it really is that if you if you if you're going for what they call the p-value of um 0 0.05 which is that there's less than a five percent chance that your uh result is is um is a fluke and it's not actually it wouldn't actually be repeated if you did it again. Um, if you just do, if you just do twenty studies, then that means that the chances are that one of them will show the result that you want. So if you have enough money, you just mm -hmm. do twenty studies until your yeah. p value is, is less than 0 0.05, and then you have the study you need to show what you want to show, even yeah. if it's not going to be repeatable in nineteen out of twenty studies, and. Mm -hmm people don't realize that that's what go, goes on, right? Yeah, I mean, corruption is rife. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of people just doing their own research. And um, I don't know, I've had kind of life lessons over the years that were that have really highlighted to me the, the need to do your own research and not just automatically trust the so-called experts in anything, really. Um, so to be able to think yourself and do whatever reading you need to do or seek alternative opinions, because um, there's definitely a whole range of opinions out there. Um, I, I quite often think about veterinary medicine as well, because some of my life lessons have come from one of my dogs who was had a serious autoimmune condition when she was young and she was paralyzed and had to be admitted to hospital in Glasgow, actually. And then I wasn't happy with the treatment she was getting. It was a really rare disorder, so nobody really knew how to treat it. And I ended up finding a Yahoo group where there were other owners of dogs who'd been treated quite successfully from a veterinary neurosurgeon in Boston um, and went through quite a rigmarole to try and get her treated long distance by this person because I felt that that was probably her main chance of survival. But the prognosis for this condition was six months um, at the time of diagnosis and she was three at the time. But anyway, after phoning around various vets, quite a number actually eventually managed to move to one who was willing to work with this guy long distance and uh, with a huge cocktail of toxic kind of chemotherapeutic drugs and steroids for a year, but she needed that at the time to, to recover. And she got through that and came off treatment a year later. And um, that was 11 years ago now. So and she's still going. And that really highlighted for me because there were a lot of scare tactics that were used by the, the uh, neurologists who we'd seen in Glasgow about certain drugs that were in this American Vets protocol because I'd taken his paper to them just saying could we do this as an option and they hadn't been willing to treat um, so yeah that, that was eye-opening and a real lesson to to trust your own judgment on things and not just automatically believe what you're told at appointments as official as they may be um, and then laterally I suppose I don't want to make it all about dogs but <laughs> 
kind of having qualified in functional medicine, I'm aware there are parallels in the veterinary world between mainstream vets and then holistic vets that you get. Um, so I've had some really good treatment in Glasgow again, funnily enough, um, from the herbal vets there. So yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I read somewhere that uh, the reason you don't see as many Irish setter dogs anymore is at some point in the 80s, uh, the major pet food manufacturers changed their base from corn to wheat and that uh, setters are highly sensitive to gluten. Mm -hmm. right. So the, the quality of the litters just was decimated. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, you know, all this raw dog food, which I think is ideal, Oh, yeah. six seven pounds a kilo brilliant you know it's high quality stuff people balk at the idea of spending three or four pound a kilo on 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 beef mints for themselves it's funny mm -hmm. isn't it yeah oh i know <laughs> I, i'm in a raw feeding uh, group on facebook and i i'm sure i've seen some posts of people who are vegetarian and and um and it's great that they're doing the right thing for their dogs but at the same time i'm, I'm sitting there thinking why don't you apply the same logic to you so they're talking about a species appropriate diet um and all the evidence uh really points towards that not being a vegetarian diet for us um yeah there's a you know there's, there's something I, i've mentioned before and I've, i was talking to ian campbell about and um you know the this idea that we have you know our two two hemispheres in our brain and one who wants to uh, trust the expert line to have to grasp the world in a very literal sense um, and to uh, put things to bed to say like Lord Kelvin did at the turn of the last century basically science is finished and he was a very accomplished engineer and, and uh, physicist but then of course quantum physics happened and uh, Einstein did what he did and it is just ridiculous so you have these um, echo chambers in your own mind telling you that something is true, even though if you really just engage your common sense side for a second, you would see that it's not. And I think a lot of that goes on on all sides of the nutrition debate. Um, mm -hmm. And something you see with uh, expertise in anything to do with the body, you know, um, I think we often get into trouble when we treat our bodies as machines. And, and, you know, I'm a huge advocate of the stuff that Georgia Eads says. And one of my, my favorite quotes to say all the time is when she said, um, studies have shown conclusively that the head is in fact part of the body. You know, <laughs> yeah. Of course, what you eat is going to affect mm -hmm. your mental health. It's, it's, it's almost so obvious. It's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I'm also thinking about, you know, personal trainers who look like Mr. Olympia, but have body dysmorphia, or really anyone who neglects a kind of holistic approach to health in favor mm -hmm. of this like list of rules or mm -hmm. um, their own sets of experts about their physiology. So, you know, besides eating high quality, uh, mainly animal based foods, what are other powerful levers that you think people can pull uh, besides what they eat to really improve their mental health? Okay. Um, yeah, quite, quite a few different perspectives on that, I think. So, I mean, physical activity, absolutely. So um, I'm a big proponent of maintaining strength and muscle mass and so on, particularly as people age, um, but also just low level um, aerobic type activities such as walking when, when somebody's depressed you know there's good evidence that exercise can help in a lot of cases um i'm not so good at meditation myself but i know there's a lot to that <laughs> so yeah i like to meditate probably about a year ago now but i don't practice it anywhere routinely enough um, i'd like to do that more but just trying to fit it in but i know i know of a lot of people who've benefited um, from making that a, a routine aspect of their day um i you know i suppose i i tend to go for more holistic type treatment so i have personal experience with chinese acupuncture um i don't know a huge amount about chinese medicine although the vets that i'm seeing in glasgow they, they that's what they practice as well as western herbal medicine and I, I do think there's something in that and i think there's more in terms of you know considering energy in the body 
in general, probably something that Chinese medicine does a lot better than any sort of Western medicine. I don't claim to, to be an expert in any of that, but my own experience of um, Chinese acupuncture is that it does something quite profound. Mm. Uh, so I don't know if that's something you've ever tried. but um, It's not, and I, I absolutely wouldn't discount any uh, type of therapy because, <laughs> I mean, in the end, plus placebo which i'm not saying what you're talking about is mm -hmm. but for example placebo usually re uh, you know regresses to the mean so that it's in the long term not a solution but if someone feels consistent positive benefits then they have had consistent positive benefits there's no two ways about it the experience yeah. of the individual is uh unassailable so mm -hmm. whatever for whatever reason like you say, you know, you can speculate about the causes. And I think there's a lot, you know, I think if you do aerobic exercise in a cave in the dark, the yeah. benefits might not be as good as if you do it yeah. in, in the woods mm -hmm. or in a lake or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, oh, yeah, so nature is a big one, definitely. And do you think touch might have something to do with the acupuncture? Human touch? Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I suspect from my point of view, possibly not, but yeah, I really don't know because I I've got an N of one and I can't I can't uh, pull out certain aspects of the acupuncture treatment and try it again in a different way to know. And I suppose it's an N, an N of one introvert view. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Very true. But I mean I used to come out of those sessions and and I felt like I'd be give, been given a major tranquilizer. So I was sedated. Um my husband used to pick me up and he would say, are you all right? And I'd be in the passenger seat of the car and I'd say, just like, give me a few minutes. And, and, um, and, but even that experience was a bit variable. So some days it was much more profound, that experience. Um, but I, I know of others where they've had similar experiences with acupuncture. I've um, had a similar experience with uh, chiropractic treatment, which, okay. you know, is similarly attacked. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you know, the, nothing in these alternative or holistic approaches can be discounted on the subjective experience of the patient, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And just because there doesn't exist a randomized controlled trial, for example, it doesn't mean that the evidence isn't there. And so I think anecdotal evidence is huge. And on, on an individual level, if somebody has success with any one given intervention, even if there isn't a published trial in it, then I wouldn't automatically dismiss that. I think that's dangerous. And I, but I think too much of that goes on in mainstream medicine. So people seem to place so much emphasis on evidence-based medicine. But sometimes when I, I quite often, when I talk with patients and some of them want to know what are the chances of responding to this, that or the next treatment. And I usually end up saying, but you know, statistics when it comes down to one person, it doesn't really apply, does it? So we have to try and see um, and not everyone wants to hear that, but that, that's my perspective on it. Yeah, it is comforting to quantify, um, but in a way, deadening. Mm -hmm. That's quite a vague statement, but I hope you know what I mean. I think I do. <laughs> you know, when we try to capture the, the quote unquote truth of the matter in numbers and stats, mm -hmm we get a truth of the matter, but mm -hmm. we almost slice away a huge chunk of something that is also the truth of the matter. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that, definitely. Um, you know, something that came up with, uh, with Agnes Aiton and Ali Ibrahim, and, and I tried to bring it up with others too, is, you know, the question of, this explosion of Ill, mental ill health over the last 50 or so years, maybe a hundred years, um, and probably not great mental health during the industrial revolution in the cities, you know, um, do you think, do you think there's a dominant thing going on? For example, some kind of trauma or um, some kind of environmental change or something else? Or not? Um, I think they're probably all different facets to it. So, I mean, obviously, I'll automatically come back to 
diet and what's changed in the last 100 years there, particularly with seed oils, industrial seed oils, and then um, the, the guidelines in the 70s and the 80s um, that have just led to an explosion of obesity and type 2 diabetes, essentially. Um, but I think, I think there'll be something in terms of societal changes. Um, and yeah, how do I put this into words that are PC, really? I, I think kind of nuclear families, um, that there, there's been a shift over the last 100 years um, and stress that goes with social isolation. And I think technology is only going to make things worse from that point of view. So you look at the younger generation growing up now and the amount of time that they want to, to spend on screens and, and, um, and, you know, yeah, sure, socializing with friends via a screen is one thing, but I, d I don't think it's a, a complete replacement for actual just human interaction face to face. But I think, I think there are issues that way. I'm environmentally start to think about plastics in the environment. Um, I've got other thoughts about kind of mold toxicity and heavy metal toxicity. So I think there are all of those aspects to consider too. I think it's quite a toxic world that we live in these days, pollution, um, environmental changes, microplastics and so on. Um, I live in a city, but I, I know that that's not ideal. Uh, it's probably much healthier to live somewhere rural. So yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, no, it does. And it, and it asks more. Um, and I think that's, I think that's right. You know, the, the idea that there's sometimes a myopic view that it's just this or it's just that. And I don't think that's particularly helpful. Um, you know, there's some interesting papers, very strong epidemiology on South Sea Islanders, uh, where it, it doesn't seem that there was really any schizophrenia at all. Mm -hmm. And then after some kind of industrialization, there was schizophrenia to the same level as you find in the West. Now, mm -hmm. what on earth is going on there? Is it just the food? Is it alcohol too? Is it in the mix of them? Is it a societal organizational thing? Is it a combination of all of them? Is it something else? Is it just, you know, there's all sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I suspect most things are a combination. Um, that's maybe a safe, a safe line to go with, but, but I, you know, I think it's true. I think it's not, it's rarely just ever one, one single thing. Um, I think diet could be a huge aspect of it, but. It's at least diet, it's at least something we can control, right? pretty much mm. yeah because it's hard to control some of the other things you know we can't unplug ourselves totally from society unless we want to make huge disruptive changes to our lives which might be really negative in other ways you know there's benefits to modern society of course um, yeah of course yeah yeah I, I think it's going to be interesting in the coming 10 20 years just what continues to happen in terms of the the, the rise in mental health disorders. I know the last two years haven't helped at all. Um, don't want to get too political about it, but uh, I think isolation has been a, a huge factor and um, yeah, the economic impact of, of decisions that have been taken in terms of lockdowns and so on. You know, I see that every day and still see that every day in my NHS work. Um, so people come into the service who just wouldn't have been anywhere near psychiatric services, I don't think had the last couple of years been a bit different that's sad mm -hmm. is there i was going to say what's the situation with metabolic psychiatry in the uk is there a situation is there a scene at all are you it uh, besides agnes and yeah. ali yeah and, I think, and ian campbell i don't think there's anything really established yeah i think it's growing um uh, nowhere official that I'm aware of in, in the UK, so certainly no NHS facilities as such. Um, I've had I've had somebody over the last couple of years trying to contact me, who's obviously somebody who sees a psychiatrist elsewhere in the city, and, and they must have found me on the Diet Doctor website. Um, and I, yeah, I was talking earlier about just feeling incredibly guilty that there was this person phoning up our emergency service where my NHS colleagues answer the phone saying they need to speak to me specifically need to speak to me and then 
they kept trying to pass a message on but didn't have a specific me message and then eventually said oh they need to speak to me about keto because I'm the only person they can speak to and um and just with uh, where I work in the service it's not possible for me to see them you know unless they become fairly unwell and, and need a crisis team intervention um but yeah so I, I suppose I have aspirations that there will be developments in this field um I'd certainly like to be involved in that whether that's whether that's NHS, I don't know at this point. Um, it's a very difficult, I mean, the NHS is a massive organisation. It's very difficult to, to make changes, particularly in, in the bigger city areas, because uh, there's so much politics and, and differing management structures involved in making any changes. Um, but certainly, you know, the, the trial that Ian Campbell's involved in, um, and I'm taking, I'm helping out with that as well. I think it will only help once there's some more published research because then certainly other colleagues should take things more seriously. Um, but yeah, it's just frustrating that it has to, it has to be that way around, um, particularly when funding is very difficult to come by for these kind of trials where there's not going to be a pharmaceutical product at the end that can be marketed for, for profit. Yeah, I mean, Virta is an interesting one because they use an app and counselling and so on in a way that's semi-intellectual property uh, protected. Um, they've got the brand, if you like, um, and they've got a very high valuation now as a company. Mm -hmm. So when you can prove that something helps, I think investors are interested. Um, and then I think sometimes with health that's the way around it goes like you say um there's you know funding's very scant for uh trials that uh don't involve a sellable thing so you know it, i can see a verta type thing but for mental health at some point um you know th that does well because it's it's a company that can be you know monetized uh, and then ultimately that could filter into the NHS as an option, much like low carb is filtering into the NHS as an option for diabetes because of the likes of David Unwin, who've pioneered it for the best part of 10 years. And you really can't, just can't argue with the results. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you do argue with the results, then I, I would just say that you're deluded. Um, mm -hmm. And I hope that that will be the same soon for, for metabolic psychiatry. Um, mm -hmm. You've written a book about it, haven't you? I have, yeah, just um, uh, published in the last week. So, yeah, so that I think I was saying to you earlier, I, I, I didn't set out to like write a long book, but I wanted it to be an accessible book where really I was thinking about the people who don't know an awful lot about ancestral health or um, kind of species appropriate diet, um, nutrient dense food. Because I, I think we've we've all been bombarded with these constant messages for for decades now about what what's right to eat and what's healthy and and I'm not sure I've seen a, a sensible suggestion in, in in the mainstream media when it comes to that for well as long as I can remember really um, so yeah I set out just to cover really the basics of the science and do a bit of a whistle stop tour as to the arguments for, for using very low carb diets or even low carb diets for mental health. Um, and then the different dietary options that might be available to people. I touch a little bit on food addiction and, and about other routes that people might go down if, if changing their diet completely hasn't resolved all of their issues. Um, but then that's getting more into the functional medicine sphere as opposed to mainstream NHS. Um, that's really interesting because Chris Palmer, who I mentioned, um, may, the, the episode may or may not be out by the time ours comes out, um, has written a book that's coming out in November 22, uh, really aimed at doctors and scientists because he sees that as his calling in in the area um so i think it's great that you've got something which is really aimed at people who don't have that kind of background you know mm -hmm. you're covering those different bases yeah and it, like it was fun for me to write because like although you know although i've got a medical degree and i've been practicing for years now and i've got 
I've got a medical law degree as well, which was another interest, but more, more the medical ethics side of things, <laughs> which, which does influence my thinking on all, all of this too. But despite those degrees, I'm not, um, I'm not really a facts and figures sort of person. I just like to distill things down to the basics and make things straightforward because that's how, that's how I remember things. And so, yeah, I, I just felt as though that would be my place to try and write something that would be relatable to people and hopefully try to break down some of the complex jargon that comes with, with the field of medicine. Um, so I'll be interested to see what people think about it. At the moment, it's, uh, well, yeah, I've had a few sales. It's, a lot of my nursing colleagues have been reading it. So, um, and this is something I haven't really discussed in a lot of detail with them. So I'm sure we'll have some really interesting conversations in the office. That's great. Uh, so what's sure. it called and where can people get it? It's called Metabolic Madness and it's available on Amazon. So it's on Kindle and you can get a print version as well if you prefer that. Brilliant. Yeah, the... Um... Yeah, that whole uh, that whole question around um, what your colleagues think mm -hmm. is an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, I had to, uh, yeah, so, so I don't really speak to my consultant colleagues so much, like one or two know about my, my lifestyle choices, but a lot of the others I don't necessarily have meetings with or sit down discussions with all that often. So it's more nursing staff and um, we work in a big office for our team and you know inevitably someone asks me about it and starts a conversation and, and a few months ago one of the male nurses I work with walked in on a conversation and he said oh what's this about and someone said oh Rachel she only eats meat and then he he turned around and looked at me in complete shock and said but you're the picture of health and I said yes <laughs> and uh yeah so we, we have some funny conversations um, there are quite a few of them interested now, I think, in, in finding out a bit more. Um, so yeah, it's, like, it's that clash again, isn't it, of, you know, one of one part of our brain wanting the experts to have put everything to bed, and then the other part, which is our experience, which we're almost scared of believing, mm -hmm. you know, because it's maybe a taboo to believe your own common sense somehow. It's kind mm -hmm. of uh, it's kind of a strange situation, and I, I, you know, I think looking at medical ethics is is a Pandora's box, really, because you know, having interviewed people like Grant Schofield, professor in public health in New Zealand, you know, you really do talk about um, quality of life years, and you do you do try to sensitively quantify the benefits of of. Um, of of treatments and it's not necessarily because of some sort of uh limit to resources that's one factor but you really want to know how effective something is at improving people's lives mm -hmm. but people hate people are scared of that for sure um you know it's, it's almost like the trolley problem or if you have a million pounds and you can give people dialysis for the five people dialysis for the rest of their lives or save one person who's missing at sea what do you do you know all that stuff mm -hmm. um it, you know it, people mostly just want to put their fingers in their ears and go la 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 don't they rather than answer these types of questions oh yeah i mean people i think a lot of people think there's endless resource um, and they don't realize that healthcare rationing has to go on in the nhs and, and difficult decisions have to be made at crucial times, um, you know, in, in certain instances. And, but yeah, fascinating, fascinating subject. And um, yeah, I get frustrated at the unethical <laughs> practices that happen, certainly just coming back to the whole research, the whole research uh, field and, and what gets published and what doesn't get published. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I had, an, I had a thought when you were speaking there, I, I sometimes think to myself about, about the more kind of low carb, keto carnivore community and the sorts of people who gravitate towards that. And I wonder how many of us are more rebellious by nature, and, you know, just, just naturally, intuitively, and more likely to question, question mainstream narratives in terms of diet and health. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think you, you know, one becomes at risk of being put into some sort of um, tinfoil hat brigade group, which presumably is uh, a, a, an end of a spectrum um, that, that everyone is part of to the point where at the other end you'll have people who'll say 
um, that uh, they were only following orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know which end of the spectrum I fall into as well, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Quite proudly, I would say so. <laughs> I think I would rather be there and mm -hmm. risk being wrong sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, I, yeah, to say that science is settled is just one of the most anti-scientific statements ever, um, if not the one. Yeah. I agree. Well, I mean, that's a, I think that's a, a fun place to finish. Um, so besides Metabolic Madness on Amazon, where can people find you? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm on Instagram as Carnivore Shrink. Um, I do have a website, although I probably need to update it. Um, but my website is foodforthoughtpsychiatrist.com. Um, but probably Instagram is the place where I'm most active. All right, brilliant. Well, I really appreciate your time. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing where it all goes. Thank you. Yeah, nice talking to you. Thanks very much. You too. Thanks, Rachel. Okay.